my name is Dan Brumberg. I'm a associate professor of government at Georgetown University and a senior advisor to our democracy and governance program. I'm delighted to be here this morning to uh, participate in this session organized by the AB Center in Washington, DC, where I'm also a senior fellow. Uh, and we're gonna be discussing the entire implications of the Saudi-Iran uh, China negotiated renewal of relations. The title of our session this morning is The Global Significance of the China Brokered Saudi Iran Deal. Um, uh, and of course, we're going to be, as the title suggests, looking at the global uh, implications of uh, this deal. But we're also going to be discussing, in that context, also the regional implications not least of which are for the perhaps the most important conflict in the region uh, that uh, is and that is the one between uh, Iran, Israel and the United States. Um, so there's a lot to discuss about and each of our uh, terrific participants will be addressing one aspect or another of uh, this uh, this amazing and extraordinary development, its implications globally and its implications uh, locally or regionally as well. So let me just introduce our speakers. We have four terrific panelists. Several of them are friends, longtime friends of mine and associates. Each of the panelists will have 10 to 12, more like 10 minutes. I'm going to do my best to uh, be a polite enforcer of that limit. And then we will go into um, a discussion animated, of course, by questions from our audience. So here is the order of presentations. We'll start with Christian Coach Ulrichsen, who is a non-resident senior fellow at the Arab Center and a fellow at the Middle East, uh, 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 a fellow for the Middle East at Rice University's Baker Institute, where I used to hang out a little some years ago, off and on. Dina Esfandiari is a senior advisor for Middle East and North Africa at the International Crisis Group. And while I don't think I've ever met Dina before, I, I really much appreciate all the work she's been doing all these years uh, on her reporting from the region, uh, particularly on uh, Iran. Dania Thafer is the executive director of Gulf International Forum. We haven't met as well, but hello. Imad Harb is the director of research and analysis at the Arab Center in Washington, DC, and, uh, and periodically the man who gives me really good advice and everything I uh, right for the center, I'll add that much. And Barbara Slavin is a distinguished fellow for the Middle East and North Africa, uh, uh, for Middle East and North Africa at the Simpson Center. And somebody I've known for well, I guess I'm not going to say as many years as as it has been. It's been it's been it's been more than a couple of decades, I think. So uh, we're going to start off with Kristen for your remarks, and then we'll go uh, we'll go to uh, Dina. So Kristen, please. Thank you for. Having me, thank you for putting together this very timely discussion. I'll talk a bit about what has maybe motivated the Saudi policy decision to not only reach an agreement to restore relations with Iran, but also to choose China as the uh, uh, the vehicle with which to make that final push. We've seen, obviously, several rounds, at least five rounds of dialogue between Saudi Arabia and Iran over the last uh, two plus years. So this agreement didn't come out of thin air, but of course its timing and the location of its announcement did come as something of a, of a surprise. Yeah. Now, Saudi policy towards Iran has been obviously gone through times of strain, but also through periods of rapprochement. And one of the more interesting things for me for the bilateral statement from March the 10th that was released in Beijing was the reference to the previous agreement signed by Saudi Arabia and Iran in 1998, an economic agreement and a security cooperation agreement in 2001. Now, of course, those agreements then gave way to a period of intensified regional competition, uh, partly, perhaps largely resulting from the aftermath and the fallout from the US-led invasion of Iraq, which we just marked the 20th anniversary of. And bilateral relations obviously became tense in and after 2011, when Saudi Arabia and Bahrain tried to 
uh, deflect away from some of the root causes of some of the unrest, especially in Bahrain during the Arab Spring, and effectively try to push the blame for the unrest on meddling from Iran and other regional states. In 2016, we saw the trigger for the uh, cutting of ties, which uh, this agreement now seeks to restore, which was the aftermath of the execution of Nima al Nima, the Saudi Shia cleric, and 48 other people, many of whom were uh, Sunni radicals from a Saudi perspective, and of course, the uh, storming of Saudi diplomatic compounds as a result. Now, in 2015, up until about 2018, Saudi policy towards Iran, or at least Saudi rhetoric towards Iran, was much more hawkish, much more assertive. We saw Mohammed bin Salman giving statements such as, we will make sure that any fight with Iran takes place in Iran itself. And we saw, obviously, the Saudi-led intervention in Yemen in 2015, the same week that uh, P5 plus one negotiators were meeting in Vienna to finalize what became the JCPOA. Effectively, we saw the Saudis and the UAE signaling to the Obama administration that they didn't think that you could just contain negotiations with Iran to one file only, the nuclear file. But from their point of view, Iran's destabilizing regional activities and support for groups around the Middle East was something that they, the Saudis and the UAE, were going to take on themselves. Now, clearly, the war in Yemen hasn't gone the way that uh, had been hoped. It has been a sobering lesson in the limitations of the ability to project power and force, uh, especially outside their borders. But what really was a game changer, which led, I think, to the whole process of changing mentalities in Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states was the maximum pressure campaign launched by the Trump administration in 2018, after it withdrew from the JCPOA, and Iran's response, which led to a series of maritime and energy hits on Saudi Arabia and the UAE between May and September 2019. And most shockingly, from Riyadh's perspective, the attack on Ab Kaik and Al Quraysh on Saudi oil infrastructure in September 2019, which temporarily knocked out almost half of Saudi Arabia's oil production. In 2006, there had been a similar attack, uh, but that was almost analog compared to the uh, scale of the 2019 attack. 2006 attack were a suicide truck ramming the gates and blowing itself up. This one were missile and drone strikes, which evaded uh, defenses, caused absolute pinprick damage in terms of accuracy, and really put the Saudis on notice that they could be targeted anywhere, anytime, and the UAE as well. And I think what was also more shocking was that two days later, Donald Trump said this was an attack on Saudi Arabia. It wasn't an attack on us signaling to the Saudis and to the UAE that uh, he was drawing a distinction between US interests and their interests. And I think the assumption had been, especially when it came to anything to do with Iran, that those interests were one and the same. And we saw almost straight away Saudi and Emirati policy becoming much more, well, changing almost overnight. Both Saudis and the UAE separately reached out to Iran, the UAE directly, the Saudis to the uh, intermediaries in Iraq, but to de-escalate and diffuse points of tension. Now they no longer had or felt confident about full US support and backing no matter what. And this was fully, fully evident in 2020 in January when Qasem Soleimani was killed, when uh, the Saudis even sent Khalid bin Salman, the deputy defense minister to Washington to make the case in person for the Trump administration for de-escalation. Because you saw the Saudis suddenly realizing perhaps that they had to adopt a set of policies that reflected their own interests rather than their interests with the US supporting them regardless. And so we've seen much more perhaps a realism in Saudi policy, at least in terms of having to find a way of coexisting with Iran. So it's within that framework that the, the two years of on off negotiations have to be seen. And of course, the decision now to, uh, to come to the agreement. And then finally, the final point I'll make is that Mohammed bin Salman announced Vision 2030 in 2016, in April, so almost exactly seven years ago. There were now seven years left for Vision 2030 until 2030, which has become this almost totemic year for Saudi Arabia. It's become the year that Mohammed bin Salman has defined as his sort of imprint. And he needs a period of stability. He needs time now to focus on implementing the GIGA projects, implementing all the transformational changes he's trying to make. And having 
missiles and drones raining down on Saudi cities and infrastructure is not something that will help in that in the optics and also in the implementation of those phases. Uh, last week we had the Jeddah Grand Prix in Formula One. It went off without a without a hitch, but he will remember that last year the Jeddah Grand Prix was overshadowed by Houthi drones slamming into fuel depots a couple of miles away from the race, creating terrible optics, which didn't exactly give the international investor community reassurance that Saudi Arabia is a stable place to live, work, and do business. And so from Mohammed bin Salman's point of view, he needs now to focus on domestic issues to deliver Vision 2030 as it gets into its implementation phase. And so anything from his perspective that can dial down tension and give him that space domestically, I think, is is what has driven this agreement to get over the line. So with that, I'll pass back to you, Dan, and uh, thanks. Thanks, Tristan. That was a terrific summary of the events that propelled Saudi Arabia to engage in this diplomacy. And I think the underlying message there, or thesis, is that that takes place in the, in the, in the context of perception of the declining power or influence of the United States. And I think that's really an important observation. Dina, we we'll turn the mic over to you now. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for having me um, amongst the such great guests. It's it's an honor to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Iran's perspective to follow on from Christian, and uh, basically, as Christian outlined, the Iranians and the Saudis had been talking for two years before uh, they came to this agreement. So Iran's desire to de-escalate with Saudi Arabia, it's kind of been around for a while. Um, this uh, administration, the President Raisi's administration, made it clear when uh, he first came to power that focusing on the region was going to be a priority. But the previous administration of President Rouhani had also done the same. Um, so it's something that Iran sought out. It just, I think, wasn't ready uh, or willing, really, to make the compromises necessary to get there, um, obviously, until, until a few weeks ago. Um, so today, you know, why today? Why did they? Why did they finally settle on on this um, right now? Um, I think there is a an international dimension to it, and there's a domestic dimension to it. The international dimension, it's simple. Um, Iran is finding itself in a in a slightly difficult position, um, uh, to put it mildly. It's uh, it's increasingly isolated. It had a taste of what it would be like if it um, uh, right after the JCPOA, the nuclear deal in 2015, what it would be like if it was a little bit more integrated into uh, the community of, of states, basically. And then that was taken away from it um, uh, under President Trump. And so today it's it's feeling the isolation um, and it basically is trying to put in place layers of security um, against further future isolation. It's doing that by building relations with a, a whole range of states, including big powers like Russia and China. Um, but uh, de-escalation with its neighbors is also one of one thing that it's trying to achieve. And so this is the context in which this deal kind of emerged basically. And it allows Iran to turn around to the West, to the US and its allies and say, look, ultimately, you're never going to be able to isolate me in the way that you did prior to the nuclear deal. That's not going to work anymore. So that's on the international front. On the domestic front, um, there's a couple of reasons for it. Uh, I think one of the main ones is that we are firmly in the era of preparation for succession. Um, and by succession, I mean uh, the who, whoever is going to come next to replace the current supreme supreme leader Ayatollah Khamenei. Um, the Iranian system has been preparing for it for a while, uh, and part of that preparation is to ensure a certain level of de-escalation um, on Iran's foreign policy front. So it releases some bandwidth um, for the system to deal with what is going to be a pretty complicated time for um, the Islamic Republic. Uh, at a time where Iran is undergoing um, domestic discontent, which has you know, been broadcasted around the world for the last few months, it's also a distraction. Um, it's an injection, a small injection of hope. Uh, after all, the Saudis uh, are seen, and, and they are, as being a pretty wealthy nation. Um, and immediately after the deal, uh, I think it was the Saudi finance minister that came out and said, you know, we're ready to invest in Iran um, almost immediately. 
And that kind of thing is, is it, it, it really does inject hope um, inside Iran. It's important. Um, so there's definitely an economic imperative at a time where Iran economically is really um, struggling. Uh, so my reading is that they're clearly motivated. They have been wanting this for a while. Um, and so I think they're going to try to implement it as, as much as they possibly can. But the question is, what did they promise as part of this deal, right? This is the thing that everybody has been speculating on. Um, I think it's clear that uh, Yemen is, you know, something that featured as part of the discussions. Um, it seems like the Iranian compromise could have been twofold. Um, the first was that they may have made some kind of promise that they could do whatever they could to convince the Houthis to um, not start up cross-border attacks into Saudi Arabia. Um, that poses a problem in, in itself because we all know that Iranian control over the Houthis is not complete. So an Iranian promise to do what it can is, is just that, it will do what it can, but that doesn't mean that the Houthis are going to listen. The second thing that we've been hearing is that Iran may have promised to cease um, weapons transfers to the Houthis. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I was, uh, I was pretty surprised and skeptical when I first saw that. But then I guess if you think about it, um, there have been more seizures of, of weapons over the course of the last couple of weeks, months. Um, and so you could fathom that maybe Iran upped the shipments uh, in order to allow it to make a promise to seize the shipments. Um, uh, and it's not like there's a, a shortfall of weapons inside uh, Yemen anyway. So um, that could be, it could be something that the Iranians promised. Um, I was also asked to, to uh, quickly talk about the potential impacts on Iran's policies in the region, if there are any. Um, and on that, I'm a little bit more pessimistic. I'm cautiously optimistic about the deal but on the impact on Iran's activities in the region less so. Um, basically because if it's to have any impact at all, this deal would have to be implemented successfully without any hiccups, um, without anybody going back on the promises that they made. And that in itself is a massive if. Um, and then you're talking about areas. So for example, Lebanon, key security concern for Iran, Hezbollah, the jewel in the Iranian crown, um, and not an area, not a country that's particularly important to Saudi Arabia. Saudi doesn't really know what it wants with, with Lebanon. So there's not much room there uh, for, for compromise. Um, and in fact, we heard literally two days before the Iran-Saudi deal announced, Hezbollah came out and announced that their candidate for the, for the vacant presidency seat um, was probably the least compromising candidate they could have selected. So, um, you know, kind of shows that it's not exactly um, they're not they're not really willing to make any any compromises there. Syria, you know, you could argue this deal will help normalization between Assad and the Saudis. But to be fair, normalization between the Gulf Arab states and, and Assad was happening way before this deal was announced anyway. So maybe the deal will help, um, but it's definitely not what prompted it. Um, so I think that broadly there is scope for Iran and Saudi Arabia to increase their communication, to diminish their tensions in the region if this deal is implemented properly. But it really remains to be seen what kind of impact that will have on the ground in the areas that both countries are involved in. I'll stop there. Well, thanks very much. That was very helpful. And it certainly underlines the, I think, the perception of Iran's leaders that they not, if they're not in the driver's seat, they're in, certainly in a strong position. So that has implications for their willingness to uh, to uh, to uh, make uh, concessions on many fronts. Uh, we are now going to turn uh, to uh, Danya for her remarks. Thank you very much. You have the, uh, the floor, the mic. Uh, thank you, Daniel, uh, for having me and cute cat back there. Thank you very uh, much. She appreciates it. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, great power competition pertaining to the U.S. and China uh, in the Gulf region. Um, and uh, so there has been much fervor um, over China's brokered agreement for the restoration of diplomatic relations between uh, Saudi and Iran. Um, and it has been framed um, on many accounts as part of an upset 
of geopolitical realignment of the Middle East. Um, and indeed, the international system is evolving and multipolarity is a reality, but it does not mean uh, that the fundamentals of U.S.-Saudi relations are changed. Uh, the reestablishment of diplomatic ties doesn't make uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia suddenly friends, and nor does it make China eclipse uh, the U.S.'s role in the region. Uh, I mean, Riyadh and Tehran, they still have clashing interests across the Middle East. Um, and Dina, she, she even talks about like broader um, opportunities of de-escalation and I could agree with her perspectives also. And, um, and I don't think the agreement has really addressed thus far key areas of divergence. Um, and we're kind of in this wait and see moment um, so don't get me wrong, it has potential to reap great benefit uh, for de-escalation, but hasn't yet proven it. Um, and um, now when it comes to hedging versus realignment, I think nuance is very important. Um, in some analyses, I've noticed that there has been a conflation of hedging and shifting uh, alliances. Certainly Saudi Arabia and other GCC states have been looking eastward um, and increasing relations with China. But still, when it comes to great power competition, uh, the security architecture of the GC states is still uh, highly dependent on the US. Um, so in the, in the current uh, multipolar international system, uh, especially after the onset of the Ukraine war, uh, there has been more room for Saudi Arabia and the GCC states to maneuver through strategic hedging. But that does not necessarily mean realignment has occurred. However, uh, the rise of multipolarity has not affected all areas equally. This is especially the case when it comes to regional security. Now, the fact that the Gulf is the backbone of the US security architecture in the Middle East, and the US will really remain the primary security guarantor for years to come, uh, I mean, there's a still an extensive basing structure there with permanent architectures. In Saudi Arabia, there's still over 2,500 US military personnel. Um, it is true, for example, uh, that Bi the Biden administration has ended its support for the Saudi-led uh, coalition's offensive uh, military uh, operations against the Houthis, but the US still continues to provide defensive support. And the supposed like decrease of the US role uh, has been a really like a strategy for quite some time. One salient trend that stands out when reviewing the changes in US priorities as it pertains to the Gulf, um, when you look at the national military strategy or the national security strategy or the national defense strategy is that the US approach has been really similar over the last de decade. Um, since the early 2000s, under Obama, under Trump, uh, under President Biden, the U.S.'s policy has been to invest in more resources, more sustainable resource approaches to security in the Gulf. Um, there has been a push for states to work, for the U.S. to work with states in partnership through agreements, joint force enablers, training and advising. Um, and so, um, and this approach is actually called by the generals here in the U.S. as the buy with and through approach, and it's been in, in, in talks for quite a while. Um, so, and I would argue that the US's deep rooted influence in the Gulf remains quite strong. Um, I mean, it's evident even when we see leadership changes in Washington, we saw how um, a change from Trump to Biden has really uh, caused like a good amount of repositioning of, 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 of regional actors. Granted, the Arab Spring era kind of ended and the global pandemic also were major factors in shifting um, the geopolitics of the Gulf. However, I mean, the switch went from a zero sum maximalist geopolitics to a general mood of de-escalation. De and this happened shortly after Biden took office. Um, so it does show that policy choices of the US, whether to act or not to act, um, has a great influence on the strategic calculus 
of Saudi Arabia and the GCC states. It's worthwhile to note that um, the Biden administration reignited the fears in Riyadh and in other GCC capitals as well, that yet another Obama doctrine was underway. Another round of the JCPA talks that does not consider the grievances of GCC states appeared looming just uh, recently, I guess. Um, and in the context, Saudi Arabia would have diminished uh, negotiation leverage with Iran to establish uh, relations after a G JCPOA agreement. So now that the JCPOA talks pretty much failed, um, it was really the most opportune time for Saudi Arabia to enter into a negotiated agreement with Iran because Iran is currently sanctioned and pushed into a corner. Whereas if the JCPOA was reinstated, then, then Saudi Arabia would have had less leverage with a more emboldened Iran. Um, and I would argue that the US also wins from uh, Saudi Iranian detente. Um, so, so Saudi having diplomatic relations with Iran does not really conflict with US interest. Sure, we can concede um, that it does hurt the US ego a little, the way it was brokered through China, but the Biden administration has really praised the dialogue. And in fact, when you look at read the national security strategy, a pillar of, of US policy in the region is de-escalation and integration in the Middle East. And we all know Saudi-Iran tensions is a bottleneck issue for de-escalation um, in the Middle East. Um, and it just seems like it, it does fit into squarely into US policy interests, um, although it does, does bruise the US ego. Um, uh, uh, so still, I believe that China remains, now in reference to China, it may, remains uh, vital for strategic he hedging. China is a crucial part of Saudi Arabia's overall strategic hedging. Beijing is vital economic partner. Everyone knows um, that there's strong financial, economic, and I, I guess you could call some political interdependencies between both nations. It is well known fact that um, China is dependent on energy and, um, and uh, as uh, Christian noted, that, uh, that uh, Mohammed bin Salman is eager to successfully achieve his 2030 vision. But um, beyond energy security and economic relations, China does help uh, diversifying arms procurements and uh, helps Saudi Arabia uh, acquire ballistic mi missile technology. Um, uh, and that is probably arguably to strengthen uh, Saudi's deterrence capabilities against Iran. Um, so Gary Sick, uh, if anyone's in Gary Sick's group, said something very interesting <laughs> on that made me think a little bit. And he posed this question, has China lost its political virginity? Well, um, I, would, I would say it kind of was lost a long time ago if you look back in history. Um, during the 1950s and 1960s, China sought um, as an ally of the Soviet Union to confront the capitalist camp of the Western world while simultaneously seeking to draw allies into the socialist camp. And during this time, China supported the popular front for the liberation of occupied Arabian Gulf, which was a Marxist movement that was supported by Yemen and focused on Oman. And China's attempt to export its, it was shows that China attempted to export its ideology in the Gulf. So the mediation now, coming back to the current events, the mediation role appears to be really, in, from my perspective, a gift from Saudi Arabia to China. It fits precisely into China's South-South policy, you know, pan-Asian policy, and its economic interest to share, secure access to fossil fuels. You know, de-escalation de means less disruptions in fossil fuels and less price volatility. Volatility. I don't know if I said that. Um, it is a symbolic uh, snub at the US at a minimal political cost. And so the question remains as to whether Sino-Gulf relations will evolve into more concrete strategic relations or really merely emphasize on commercial relations. Will China emerge as a political player in the Gulf? And I say re-emerge um, and to what extent? when or if China crosses that threshold, um, 
we have to see if it's willing to assert itself and forcefully engage in moments of high tensions rather than ones of convenience during periods of regional reconciliation. That's when we should be concerned about it eclipsing the US strategic presence in the Gulf. Thank you. Thank you, Danya. I think you put your finger on a number of really important issues, not least of which is the fact that everybody's hedging, <laughs> Every, including China, of course, and uh, also that uh, the, the wider China's role becomes in the region or any other region, the more complex the contradictions are for China. And I might say something about that in, in a minute or two as well. We are going to turn now to uh, my comrade Imad, but before we do so, I'm going to remind everybody that you could submit questions at events at arabcenterdc.org, and I'll be paying attention to those questions as they come in again, events at arabcenterdc.org. Uh, Imad, you're next. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks for chairing the panel. I really liked your paper. This is a plug for Dan's paper we published yesterday. Uh, it's, uh, it's really quite uh, quite a, um, uh, a tour de force, so to speak, uh, regarding the US-Iran, uh, uh, the nuclear deal, uh, uh, a whole bunch of things, and China. Um, uh, uh, I uh, thank you, Dania, for uh, really, uh, uh, I will dovetail a little bit with, uh, with, your, with your remarks, but um, uh, I, I do agree with what you had to say. Uh, it's really quite good. I, I just differ a little bit on the issue of uh, uh, of uh, strategic hedging. Uh, is everybody strategically hedging, or uh, or just some uh, are? But uh, at any rate, um, uh, we're we're talking here uh, about a uh, a China that is emerging. Yes, uh, long. Uh, uh, what's, what, what did what did that song go like? Uh, you know, long uh, whatever something about uh, my friends. Uh, those were long days um, uh, when China really supported uh, uh, movements like that in the Gulf. Um, uh, communism, Chinese communism today is uh, almost like a title for uh, reactionary uh, politics uh, worldwide. Um, uh, but at any rate, uh, we're, when we're talking about China and uh, what, what, the, what China is trying to do in the Middle East with Saudi Arabia and Iran and others, uh, you know, China is defending its interests. It's uh, sub, uh, it's trying to support its own interests, economic uh, and uh, political and strategic, um, and uh, it has its own reasons. Uh, obviously, uh, specifically today, uh, with uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, winning a third term, he's he's out there uh, wants to make China a world power again, and uh, he said so. By the way, and. Uh, uh, when he was leaving Moscow, when when uh, he visited uh, uh, President Putin uh, just last week, um, uh, so uh, uh, China has to do what it's trying to do in the Middle East, obviously, because it, uh, you know Iran and Saudi Arabia supply it of a considerable amount of uh, energy uh, resources that uh, it really needs. Uh, the Chinese economy is not doing so well; uh, slower uh, GDP growth. Uh, fertility rate that is uh, alarming uh, uh, for for the future. Uh, uh, potential uh, issues of uh, uh, you know what, what do we do with uh, you know, basically hundreds of thousands of new employees uh, uh, looking for jobs, uh, especially that China the Chinese economy is dependent on the health of the international economy as well, and all those countries that. Uh, that uh, import uh, uh, things from China uh, are experiencing uh, uh, slowdowns themselves. Uh, but you know, uh, uh, the, but Saudi Arabia, as far as I'm concerned, Saudi Arabia is using the China thing. Yes, they want to sell oil. Obviously, they do. That's uh, their uh, most important commodity. Uh, they are basically strategically hedging uh, because the United States has not. Since the Obama administration, actually before the, even the Obama administration, the United States has not been ready to provide that security umbrella that the Saudis have been looking for. Uh, so they they think that maybe we can uh, you know go elsewhere. Although I really doubt that China is ready to provide that strategic that uh, that security uh, umbrella that the uh, Saudis are looking for. Um, you know the idea is you know can China really replace the United States? 
uh, and the uh, Saudi strategic understanding of of their uh, of their uh, interests. Uh, from economic point of view, um, yes, China really needs uh, their oil, but you know, uh, it, it has to do something that is reasonable, that is smart, and that is really doable. Um, uh, China is hoping that it will have a better uh, situation in the Middle East, more influence. Yes, but uh, uh, can it really go the uh, the full way? Can can it can it really provide what, uh, in general, is uh, is an idea for uh, you know? Can can it be a hegemon? Can it be a hegemonic uh, power? Uh, the United States tried it. The United States expansionist capitalist system uh, to the point of imperialism uh, is now failing at uh, being the, uh, the hegemonic power and the. Uh, in the world and in the Middle East, uh, it's doubtful. Uh, so, you know, I wonder if China is really able to uh, to provide that. Uh, for the Iranians, uh, I, I think they're just simply desperately counterbalancing, trying to counterbalance that influence that the United States has in the Middle East or that the United States might potentially have go uh, uh, going forward. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, you know, Iran, as far as I'm concerned, is. Uh, is not hedging Iran is bandwagoning because it thinks that China may provide uh, some sort of a of a challenge for the United States internationally and in the region, which is which is uh, true. Uh, uh, problem is, you know, the the Iran and the uh, and China, uh, Iran has the uh, the uh, uh, you know friendships with uh, with Russia, uh, with North Korea, Venezuela, some countries of the. Uh, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, and some others in the Middle East, but yet still, uh, I, I don't know how much China can really provide for Iran as far, we're, we're, talk, we're not talking about economic issues, obviously Iran wants the economic investments, it wants uh, assurance, you know, the, uh, the Chinese and the Iranians signed, uh, uh, I don't know how many billions of dollars uh, for over 25 years of uh, of investments in uh, in the economy, so uh, this is a great deal. But I I don't know how much, strategically speaking, militarily speaking, the Iranians can really count on the Chinese to come to their aid if there were uh, to ha anything to happen. Uh, uh, you know, the we can look at the Chinese influence uh, and and role and what China is trying to do uh, in the Middle East uh, through. Uh, you know, uh, a lot, a lot of, a lot of, there are a lot of questions that surround this. Uh, uh, I wrote some down. You know, is China willing and ready to stop being the free rider that it has so far been in international politics? Uh, you know, uh, uh, being a free rider is easy. You know, you be a free rider. Somebody else provides the international uh, security that's required on the high seas and. Uh, uh, international peace and security and all that stuff, you know, is China ready to do that? I mean, this is a very, very powerful kind of role that uh, if it wants to play it, uh, it's, it's very, very important. Um, uh, can China be the global power that can afford providing that security paradigm that imperialist the United States has been able to provide over the last few decades? Um, uh, does China want to be an imperialist power? Uh, maybe uh, President Xi Jinping is, uh, you know, willing to do that. But you know, uh, is it is it is it ready for that? I I, I really doubt that that it is. Uh, can China ignore the bad challenges that it has in its own backyard? I mean, we're talking about Japan, uh, South Korea, uh, the AUKUS uh, um, Security Alliance of the United States, Great Britain, and Australia. Uh, you know, can it really leave there to come to the Middle East? I just, I, I don't get that. Uh, is China's power fungible? Uh, we're not talking about the economic issues. We're talking about uh, other political pressure issues. Can uh, China's power be used to translate it to be, uh, to resolve some really bad, bad situations in the Middle East? Uh, I, I, I doubt it. We're, we're, we're talking about, can China really be friends with both? with all, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Israel at the same time. Uh, how, does, how does it put all these actors together? How does it work with them uh, all together? Uh, if Saudi Arabia were to join the Abraham Accords, uh, uh, will Iran really like that? Uh, and uh, and uh, will, will, will China's uh, bet on, uh, on 
uh, on the relationship between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran be a good bet? Uh, can China uh, really exert the leverage and influence that the United States has dismally not been able to, uh, to influence in some really very, very important issues in the Middle East, such as resolving the Palestinian question? Uh, uh, is China ready for uh, you know, in other areas, is China ready for the, uh, the, the, the retail politics that it takes to really deal with something called the Yemen war or the, 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 the Syrian uh, war? Uh, it's, it's, uh, or, or, you know, the, the little, little small details of Lebanese politics. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, as uh, Dan uh, uh, put in his, uh, in his paper, and I plug it again, it's very good paper, uh, <laughs> Pretty embarrassing there. <laughs> can China really translate? Can China do what it did with Iran and Saudi Arabia? Can it do it for Iran's nuclear power, uh, nuclear uh, uh, program? In other words, can it really produce on the stalled negotiations over the nuclear program today? So these are these are very very important questions that that you know uh, are extremely important for China's role. Uh, this is obviously not to discount the importance of what China has done between Iran and Saudi Arabia. It's very welcome. It's really quite good and uh, the region needs it. But uh, I, I really don't see it being uh, much more than just simply uh, an agreement between two neighbors who, have, who, who are supposed to be uh, good neighbors after all. Thank you. Thanks, Imad. Great questions, by the way. What you call imperialism, the Chinese called anti-hegemonic. That's the term <laughs> they prefer to use, by the way. <laughs> so, but I do recall, I think it was years ago, I was visiting this, uh, the new Israeli foreign uh, ministry in uh, Jerusalem. And I think somebody told me that the Chinese had actually built the entire structure. So they're heavily invested in the region and they're certainly heavily invested in Haifa, right? And you know, so they have this, this extraordinary, you know, projection of economic power. And I think what you're saying is that the, the, the heavy wears the crown, right? The, the more powerful they become, the more these contradictions sort of, or potential contradictions come out. So it's quite, it's quite interesting. All right, Barbara, you're next and you're going to be our last speaker, but I'm sure you have much to say. And there is still much to be said, by the way. So we're looking forward to hearing from you and then questions are already coming in. So keep them coming and then we'll move into a discussion. Go ahead, Barbara. Uh, all right, Dan, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with all of you, thanks to the Arab Center. Um, what is left to talk about? Everybody has covered so much, but um, look, I think that, that the economic aspects of China's relationship relationships with all of these countries is really crucial, and that China has been amassing massive soft power while the United States has been uh, making a number of mistakes in the region that I think have turned a lot of countries off. Um, it was in about 2010 that China became Iran's main trading partner. This was during the first bout of multilateral sanctions against Iran because of its nuclear program. And China supplanted the European Union as Iran's main uh, trading partner. Um, a decade after that, uh, Iran, uh, sorry, China became the main trading partner for the GCC. Uh, we have fossil fuel producers who are shoring up ties with their biggest importer at a time when the rest of the world is certainly trying to wean itself off oil and gas. Um, and so this may be a kind of temporary phenomenon, but for the next couple of decades, China is going to be buying most of the oil that's coming out of the Persian Gulf. And so this is kind of natural that China would step into a kind of mediating role uh, in addition to its economic role. I think we also have to look at the, uh, the impact of uh, economic sanctions on, on Iran, certainly, but on other countries um, and a desire on the part of Middle Eastern countries to build uh, stronger relations with China, which has shown that it's willing to, to bust sanctions, to buy Iranian oil, even though uh, there are secondary sanctions on it since the US withdrew from the JCPOA. Um, we also have to remember that China has an agenda. Uh, Xi Jinping has made it very clear 
that he is looking to take Taiwan at some point, which means that China may join the so-called coalition of the sanctioned with Iran and with Russia. And I'm looking to see whether these agreements that are being brokered are going to have another aspect to them. And, and that is the question of uh, de-dollarization. Will we begin to see more and more countries uh, selling oil and getting UN in return? Uh, the Saudis have not gone that far, but they have hinted at it at various times. Um, that, of course, would be an enormous blow to the United States and would be an enormous blow to the role of the dollar in terms of the international uh, economy. Um, so, so far, no, but it's certainly something that I think we have to, we have to watch. Um, what else will the, the Chinese do in terms of mediation? Uh, you know, the Russians actually have now uh, picked up the slack on the mediation between the Saudis and the Syrians. Uh, in case anyone hadn't noticed, there were talks in Moscow. And of course, it was mentioned that this trend of rehabilitation of the Assad regime predates this agreement between, uh, between Iran and Saudi Arabia. But it's part of a sense that um, uh, this look east strategy on the part of Iran, on the part of other countries, also includes Russia. Uh, just yesterday, of course, the Saudis announced that they were going to join, I believe, the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So um, you can call it, I think, as, as Danya did, hedging and not yet realignment. But something is shifting in the Middle East. There is a kind of, uh, a kind of turn. And, you know, where there is economic power, where there are economic relationships, other relationships may, may follow. Um, so I think that this is a serious moment for, uh, for US policy. It's, it's more than just uh, egg on the face of the United States um, when it comes to watching you know, a rival superpower broker an agreement. Uh, there are trend lines here that, that should be concerning, frankly. Um, I would advocate that it means the United States has to rethink its approaches, particularly toward the use of, of economic sanctions, which I think are backfiring more and more, uh, that we have to make sure that we maintain ties with uh, not only the countries in the region, but also with the Chinese, that we make sure that we are not uh, putting ourselves in a situation where we are no longer capable of brokering agreements uh, among adversaries. Um, you know, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, at Davos and also at the Munich Security Conference, um, the Russians weren't there, the Iranians weren't there. What are we doing in the West in terms of limiting our own ability now uh, to moderate and mediate between adversaries uh, in various conflicts? Um, bears watching. So um, I think those are the major points that I that I wanted to to raise. Um, I would also point out a very nice piece that we have up today on the uh, by Giorgio Cafiero, many of you know him on the Syria uh, rehabilitation and on the Russian role in bringing the Saudis and the Syrians back together. Um, you know, Russia and China are showing that that they can walk and chew gum at the same time. And it's not enough for us to simply say, well, these countries are bad actors, the Russians are bad actors. No, they have, they have the ability because of their diplomatic relations with all parties in the Middle East, unlike the United States, to broker deals. And we need to pay attention to that. That's a very important soft power. Well, thank you very much, I, Barbara. I think that uh, what you said remind me, I mean, my sense of it is there's almost kind of a hysteria here in Washington about Chinese power, um, which has a kind of momentum of its own <laughs> that uh, is, is quite remarkable. It's, it's just a, a kind of, you know, who's leading a return to the Cold War here? And um, of course, the Chinese are not helping their, you know, who's, wh where are they buying oil right now from Russia? 
And there's some tensions already in the in the Gulf countries about the China's purchase of, of Russian oil. There were some you know loud complaints in the last few months. You heard that. Well, I understand it was quite a remarkable shift in terms of, but of course that purchase of oil is helping to su sustain Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine and the massacres and the you know the, the, the I mean it's it's uh, so China is you know I, I on the one hand there is a kind of hysteria about. China going on here, but on the other hand, China is, is is not being a very responsible actor, to say the least, in uh, in Ukraine. And um, this is a country whose 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 leading premise in the international community is the sovereignty of nations and the rejection of the use of force, uh, which is uh, which the Chinese leaders are always talking about. Yet in the case of Ukraine, they are funding the Russian war, and there is some concern now that they may be supplying. Uh, uh, drones. So um, it, here it is. These are the deep contradictions between uh, China's sort of impulse to be this anti-hegemonic power standing up to the United States, projecting power and so on, on the one hand, uh, and it, it being part of an alliance of global autocracies on the one hand, and then the equally important impulse to invest globally in the international political economy and 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 be a, be a, a source of investment in Israel and the Gulf and everywhere else and the Belt and Road Initiative and all this. So there's there's these two very dramatic sort of contending impulses. Uh, in it reminds me of what Kissinger used to say about Iran, which is, you know, is Iran going to be a cause or it's going to be an, is it going to be a state? I mean, you could say that about a lot of countries, right, including the United States, I suppose. But this sort of tension in China's foreign policy is is quite quite remarkable, and China. China's number one leader, as it were, um, seems to be much more erring on the side of sort of repeating his ideological premises and talking about creating steel walls with the Chinese military and all the rest of it. So uh, that doesn't help move away from a Cold War perspective, does it? And that feeds the perception here in the United States that that's where we're heading. And so the, dy the dynamic between these two players, and then you think about the implications for Taiwan, so it, it's very disconcerting. Um, so, uh, and you know, I think you know, Barbara, you, you put it right. And a number of others said so. Nimad is that what what will China do about sort of now the JCPOA is finished, right? It looks pretty dead. I mean, we constantly we're getting ready to bury it, and then there's, but it looks pretty much now that the coffin is being you know prepared. And what's the alternative? And what does Iran do? I mean, look, Iran is 84, 85 percent uh, enrichment right now. I mean, they're talking about the enrich Iranian and being enough for maybe two or three bombs. Um, you know, this is this is a this is a dynamic that is moving along in the context of of um, China's effort to sort of push regional peacemaking. And as Imad said, where does you know where's this big? Here's the elephant in the room. You know, where's this going? And does China have the capacity at all to affect any of these dynamics? I mean, I think it's a an enormously important. Uh, a question that's going to come up uh, uh, very soon, and and uh, and in ways perhaps that will not be uh, 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 could be quite dangerous. So I just I, I, you know, I'll put that out there because we're 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 talking about um, uh, and given the, particularly what's going on in Israel, the political struggles, the rise of the extreme 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 right or whatever you want to call it. This. Uh, uh, the Abraham Accords, where are they going? Well, of course, the, the UAE is looking at what's going on in Israel and asking some important questions about this new government. So I think, you know, it's, um, the, you know, the regional architecture uh, of peace or whatever we want to call it is, is, is far from firm. And I think China will get sucked into that question as we go along. So that's just, you know, my uh, my perspective. Um, so I've got, there are a lot of great questions here. Let's start with the the, the first one, which is um, how and any anybody who wishes to you know jump into this, uh, please do. How do uh, how do you how do we evaluate the reaction of the public in the region uh, to the Chinese deal, both about the deal and the role of China? That applies as much, of course, to to Iran as it does to, and there's been a quite a lively discussion in Iran about sort of relations with Russia and China that, that's still ongoing. Um, we're, you know, we forget how, how open these discussions often are, these debates. There's, I bet there's a similar discussion in the Gulf region and of course in Israel, if, they, if, if folks are not completely absorbed with the ongoing political struggles there, this issue, certainly the Israelis were quite shocked and dismayed because they felt, well, what's, what does this mean for our accords? 
So anybody who wants to jump into that and provide us sort of a perspective, Dina, maybe you want to say something about sort of where, you know, how do the, how do the, you know, of course, the Iranian public is not monolithic, nor is even the elite. So any, any insights on that would be welcome. Sure, happy to. Um, I think broadly, um, and this is not just applicable for Iran, but I would argue, um, maybe putting Israel aside, the rest of the, the region, or certainly the Gulf region, I think broadly the reaction has been pretty positive, both um, uh, vis-a-vis the deal itself, the, the potential for reconciliation, and actually, interestingly, um, vis-a-vis China's involvement in the deal. Um, in Iran, uh, I mean, Iran's sus- suspicions of China and of Russia, um, they're longstanding. They've, they've been around for ages. Uh, one of the reasons Iran uh, pursued the JCPOA to begin with was because it didn't want to be bound to Russia and China. It wanted to open up to the West. Um, when that failed, uh, I think it became a bit of a gloomy, dawning realization on the Iranian elite that actually Russia and China um, were going to be the only game in town, really, if they wanted to uh, get themselves out of isolation. Um, and that's kind of the context in which people view this deal. Um, Iranians don't feel particularly warmly uh, towards the Chinese. Um, they don't like Chinese products. They don't have good experiences with Chinese medicine. Again, that's all of that is part of the reason why they pursued the JCPOA. But um, they're also incredibly pragmatic. Uh, China was around when everybody else ditched Iran um, and walked away from it. Uh, and that uh, today is is pretty important. Um, and actually the same could be said for, for Russia, which is why you're seeing the, the rapid rapprochement with, with uh, Moscow as well. Um, so I think where they would have been very suspicious, very wary of Chinese involvement before, I think some of that has uh, dampened a little bit recently. Um, and in terms of de-escalation with the Saudis, again, I think they broadly welcome it. Um, I mentioned that small potential injection of hope at a time where things are pretty grim inside Iran. I think that counts for something, not much, but it does count for something. Um, and, and the prospect that Iran is looking for ways or that the government is looking for ways to, to get itself out of isolation, to build relationships, to boost trade, uh, to focus a little bit on, on the economy at a time where the economy has, has been shattered for years. Um, I think that's welcome, uh, given, given everything that's going on. Um, and generally the Iranians, it, I mean, again, these are broad generalizations, but generally the Iranian public right now is very much focused on domestic dynamics and the discontent and what's happening inside the country. So the more you can diminish tensions outside the country, the reasoning is the more the government can focus on fixing things inside the country if they're in a position to fix anything at all. Great. Thank, thank you very much. It's, um, I mean... I recall that the Iranian president had uh, said quite loudly uh, their disappointment thus far with China's investments and so on, and that was articulated before. So that's against that background of that very loud and direct complaint. But now there's an opportunity, perhaps, for both sides to pursue this. So that's just and Christian. Do you want to say something about sort of Gulf perceptions, elite popular about this uh, about this development, either in Saudi or be, you know beyond wherever? Yeah, thanks. Well, uh, again, the agreement, or at least the deal to put in motion a sequencing of events, seems to have been at least welcomed in media. Sometimes perhaps hard to read genuinely popular or public opinion, in part because in Saudi Arabia it's been shown that if you potentially step out of line or express an opinion that doesn't dovetail with the leadership, there could be pretty severe consequences. We've seen a number of people being jailed for lengthy sentences over the last couple of years. Having said that, I think within Saudi Arabia, the, the deal is being pitched as consistent with this sort of Saudi first nationalist approach that Mohammed bin Salman is taking, that he's putting Saudi interests first. He's reaching agreement to put Saudi interests in the region and with China at the forefront of uh, this new phase of development. He's of not necessarily wedded to relationships that were forged under his father and uncles that have guided Saudi policy, but he is taking Saudi Arabia into the future, next few years, where obviously China is going to be a major player. And so I think a lot of the 
context for how this agreement is being portrayed is within that is within that framework. And then across the Gulf, I think there's been such a shift towards, as others have said, a spirit of rapprochement and reconciliation. I think everyone was perhaps exhausted by the, the decade that followed 2011, the sort of constant rifts and the, a lot of the bitter infighting, especially during the uh, Qatar blockade crisis, was so straining, I think, that a lot of people, I think, are just very keen to just put it behind and to sort of move on to some extent. And so, again, that taps into a, a wider feeling that was underway even before the 10th of March agreement was signed. Great. We have a related question here about um, how could this deal impact MBS's vision of 2030. It might be useful for our television viewers, as they say in the business, uh, to sort of say something about what that vision is. And Danya, too, you you might want to contribute here. You know what what what, what excuse the cat? It's not a Persian cat, by the way. I want to make that clear. Um, the um, yeah. Uh, very vocal animal. Um, I, I, is it what is what does it entail? How does you know what kinds of trade offs does the 2030 vision mean in practical terms for the economy of Saudi Arabia? How does the agreement with China affect that? And I think that's sort of one set of questions. And how will it affect the and and a related question we have here is how will it affect the the all the talk of possible uh, reconciliation between. Um, or the renewal of, or the, not the renewal, but the creation of relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Now, the two countries have what I call implicit normalization. I've written about that, but how does that affect um, that dynamic? And of course, the Israelis uh, have sort of viewed this whole process as potentially affecting or undermining the whole Abraham Accord. So there's a bunch of issues, but let's start with the question of what does 2030 project means and how the China Saudi sort of relationship fits into that. Christian, you want to elaborate then and Danya maybe can take it from there. Okay, sure. Um, well, Vision 2030 began life as a program to transform Saudi Arabia's economy to try to build a bridge away from over reliance on oil and gas. Mohammed bin Salman famously said in 2016 that I think by 2020 we can live without oil. But actually, now he's in the opposite position. He needs oil prices to remain at a higher level uh, to bring in the revenues and to fund all the projects. In part because there's been a bit, there hasn't been much investor foreign investment into Saudi Arabia into any of the big projects he's earmarked. And in part, I think that has been related to issues of political risk, regional risk. There's obviously the fallout from the Ritz Carlton arrests in 2017 from some of his missteps vis-a-vis -vis Jamal Khashoggi and others, but also a sense that the region was also, uh, when Saudi Arabia was coming under attack for missiles and drones, it wasn't seen as something that was necessarily conducive to a long-term investment. So I think he needs revenues now to remain high to implement these major projects, Neom, the Red Sea, Kadir Entertainment Park, that have become identified so closely with what he's trying to do. And we've seen him trying to focus on travel, entertainment, tourism, hospitality, announcing a new airline, the massive expansion of the airport. Now, these are all economic sectors, not only where the UAE has a 20, 25 year head start, but if he's going to get them to succeed, he needs confidence in Saudi Arabian stability. And so that obviously plays into the next seven years and this uh, dynamic and this impulse to, to diffuse the points of tension that could. Uh, do derail that. It's all about de-risking the uh, the situation so you can move on with trying to push these into implementation. Because until now we've seen very kind of computer generated images, but actual sort of physical infrastructure is still being built. And so that's what he needs to focus on. Great, thank you, um, Danya. Any any remarks on you know talking about the regional architecture? And we've you know we've only mentioned the Abraham Accords. So from the perspective, I mean, this was quite a dramatic uh, a shift in the region, particularly when we think about the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain as well, but also to some extent Saudi Arabia and obviously Israel. What does this mean for for that particular sort of structure, which of course was uh, was promoted by by Trump, but also very much facilitated by the Biden administration. They're you know, heavily invest, invested, at least rhetorically, and I suppose militarily, 
given if everything that's going on in terms of cooperation militarily above or behind the scenes uh, in the region between Israel and several Gulf countries. How does this all play out uh, now that uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia are, 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 are reconciling and perhaps the two are just parallel sort of tracks that don't affect one another. So your insights would be appreciated. Your mic's not on. I'm muted, sorry. Um, I, I, I believe that Saudi has kind of had this new perspective of Saudi first, right? It's kind of like Trump, America first. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, I do think that just because they have reproached or, or established diplomatic relations actually is more proper with Iran, um, doesn't mean that Saudi Arabia wouldn't pursue its interests uh, with Israel. Now, given that, uh, what is Saudi Arabia's interest with Israel at this point? I don't think Saudi Arabia has the appetite to normalize with Israel even before this deal. And so um, I think it's too uh, costly right now. And the, the current king, King Salman, is completely against it. Now, we don't know if Mohammed bin Salman becomes king. Could things change? But I think the even the appetite among uh the citizens across the region have made it very clear that they don't welcome the idea. And Saudi Arabia has a different role, uh, as many of you are aware, than the other GCC states or UAE. Uh, it is the custodian um, of holy sites for the Muslim world. So it, it has to c consider all of these factors before normalizing uh, with Israel. Um, could it? Uh, adversely affect uh, uh, possible normalization, if even that's a stretch, that's even an option. Um, uh, maybe it changes Saudi's calculus, not seeing Iran as a full-blown threat, but I still think that Saudi Arabia sees Iran as a threat. So um, I don't think Saudi Arabia will do anything to go into Iran's corner, if if that's what people are, uh, and or, or analysts or experts or pundits have been saying that, oh, okay, now Saudi's in Iran's corner. No, I think that certainly the tensions are still there. We still haven't seen the results of the deal and haven't seen um, really if if both sides are going to stick to their agreements uh, on this deal. And so I think it's too preliminary to say, but I generally don't think that normalization is going to happen. Right. Well, I, I would agree with that. Um, Imad, you want to add anything to this particular discussion? Because we have others, but these I want to package these around. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks, Dan. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with what Dan has said. I, I don't think Saudi Arabia is rushing to normalize with Israel. Uh, uh, if for no other reason, it's because uh, the UAE is, uh, is so much into the normalization issue. So Saudi Arabia would want to be a little. Uh, different from what Abu Dhabi is thinking. Uh, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia does not want to be the one who followed the UAE into normalizing. Uh, mm -hmm. At the same time, I mean, you know, uh, like Daniel said, you know, there is a lot riding on uh, on uh, Saudi Arabia's leadership uh, of the Arab world and the Islamic world uh, and the Muslim world. So, uh, you know, this is uh, this is really. A very very heavy uh, kind of situation, but uh, uh, I, I I wanted to just uh, uh, allude to the uh, issue of uh, you know publicly speaking in the Arab world, you know the again the, the the agreement was was well received. Everybody thought that it's uh, it's really a very great coup, and uh, everybody thinks that it is going to have very very positive results on uh, on Yemen and Syria and Iraq and uh, and Lebanon. Uh, and uh, the issue is, you know, how do the states, how do the governments deal with uh, with this? That's a that's that's a different story. But uh, I think they will uh, they will wait to see how the next uh, couple of months, two three months, uh, really shape up uh, shape up. Uh, uh, by the way, I also um, uh, I'm sorry, I, I do want to plug another paper by Christian uh, last week uh, on uh, on this. So uh, everybody, please look up um, uh, Christian Ulrichsen's. Uh, uh, article on uh, on the organization uh, on the uh, agreement and uh, its impact on the GCC states on our website. Thanks, Dan. Um, we we uh, 
we've already touched this discussion already in the last few minutes on quite a number of the questions that have come through and we want to emphasize we are certainly encouraging uh, folks to send in more questions i do want to circle back and maybe barbara you want to jump on this to the elephant in the room which is sort of uh, where and and also dina as well uh first of all where i mean now that with uh, with the jcpoa pretty much out of the picture, although we still see interesting signals from the Iranians occasionally that they would, that if they can resuscitate it, they, you know, under certain conditions, they would, but the Iranian positions on, have been pretty firm and pretty difficult to negotiate, right? And when they demand an immediate ceasing of, unilateral ceasing of sanctions, a position, by the way, that the Chinese have supported, that's really a, a, a no-go in terms of the the, the, the ability of the Biden administration to respond for reasons both strategic and domestic, right? Um, but um, now we have uh, the, stand, the continued standoff between the International Atomic Agency and Iran, uh, which for a while we thought, well, maybe there was an opening to sort of resolve it. And there were talks uh, in that regard. And then that's, and this is just a few weeks ago, right? And yet we, the reports, which seem pretty, you know, pretty convincing of what Iran has achieved in terms of its enrichment are, are quite extraordinary. Um, and what Iran started out as a kind of, the experts will tell us that Iran's enrichment program was directed as a, as a form of leverage, right? Uh, in, the, in the context of trying to renegotiate or resuscitate or whatever the JCPOA and that by increasing enrichment, they were increasing their leverage and signaling the West and so on. But now they've reached a point where the perception of the enrichment program, maybe in Iran, but certainly abroad, is that it's not, it's no longer about leverage. And that once you get up to 85, 88% enrichment, well, by God, you know, let's, what's the next step? Let's experiment with elements of weaponization. We know that weaponization is a big word, covers a lot of issues. It's it doesn't happen overnight and revolves a lot of steps, not least of which is testing. And the Israelis are not going to sit there and watch this evolve and just not react, right? Uh, particularly if it looks serious and the Israelis uh, 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 see it as serious. And I, I mentioned in the paper that I wrote for the Arab Center that when, uh, uh, when Grossi said, uh, when he was visiting uh, I believe it was Tehran, he said, you know, we, we reject the use of force, it's illegal. And the Israeli, Bibi said, well, excuse me, this is, you know, we do not accept this statement. Uh, and, the, you know, the Israelis don't perhaps have the means to unilaterally attack Iran and, and, and do permanent damage to its nuclear capacity. But nevertheless, it's, 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 it's a potentially volatile situation. So, could you talk, Barbara, a little bit, anybody else can jump into this, Dina, as well, about a sort of where this stands and, you know, does, does the China, Iran, Saudi thing just go on without having any impact? Does China step up? I mean, this is not something that, this is not a situation that is, that the regional actors are going to ignore. Um, and any, you know, we just had the re re recent dust up in, in eastern Syria, uh, and that was pretty significant, right? And Biden, you know, got in there, and it, it, so any any mis, miscalculation, any could could suddenly turn a, a local dust up into something much bigger, right? Uh, even if the parties don't necessarily want it. So, you know, what what happens with all this? Uh, what will the Biden administration do? How does it view the China role at, at all relevant? Will China use its leverage? to press the Iranians? Will they perhaps establish themselves or try to sell themselves as a mediator, which that would be interesting. So yeah, so any any comments on this, uh, the elephant still sitting in the room? Let's start with Barbara on this. All right, well, thank you. If, I mean, yeah, easy questions. Um, oh, sure, yeah, simple. <laughs> uh, a couple of thoughts. First of all, the Chinese have not been active players in efforts to revive the JCPOA any more than they were active in negotiating the JCPOA to begin with. Um, uh, we had an event a couple of weeks ago at the Stimson Center and um, Kelsey Davenport of the Arms Control Association, I asked her whether China might now you know, step in and try to do something useful on the nuclear front. And she said, look, if they were going to do something, they would have done it a long time ago. 
So I would not count on the Chinese uh, reviving the JCPOA. I think the JCPOA is dead. And we're in a situation now where there are efforts to patch together something else that might stabilize the situation and prevent the kind of dire uh, situation that you described. Um, one good factor, I think, is that given this emphasis on regional de-escalation and so on, for the Iranians now to do something really provocative on the nuclear front would clearly upset its effort to reconcile uh, with, with the Saudis. Uh, and as Dina pointed out, I mean, the Iranians want to, to tamp down the tension for a while. Uh, I will point out there was a, there was a brief uh, bump in the value of the Iranian currency after the um, agreement was announced. Uh, the reconciliation agreement with the Saudis, but that has already disappeared. And the real is once again, you know, sinking like a stone. So if the Iranians were to do something really provocative on the nuclear front, I mean, the currency, the bottom would completely fall out of it. And already inflation is at 60%, I think I saw recently. Um, so it's in Iran's interest to sort of tamp this down. If we want to be hopeful, we could see a release of, a, of American hostages, three dual nationals. They're, they're very advanced negotiations underway to try to get these people freed that involves some unfreezing of Iranian assets uh, to be spent on humanitarian goods. There was a hope this would happen before the Persian New Year. It didn't, but there are still talks underway. And then the next step would be some sort of gesture for gesture uh, freezing the Iranian program, rolling it back a little bit in return for uh, some other concessions on, on the sanctions front. You mentioned Iran enriching to 84%. They did, but they didn't accumulate any uh, uranium at that level. The concern is about a large quantity of uranium enriched to 60% and another large quantity enriched to 20%. Taken together, Iran could make four nuclear weapons out of this stuff in fairly short order. So that's a concern. The other concern is monitoring by the IAEA. Can you increase transparency? Mm -hmm. There were some promises made. They haven't followed through. They haven't reinstalled or turned on cameras, uh, but they have, I believe, increased the uh, number of visits to an underground site called Fordo. Um, so some limited steps, but if they increase transparency, that would also go a long way to uh, calming, calming folks down at least a little bit. The last thing the Biden administration or anybody wants is a nuclear crisis with Iran when we've got all this other stuff going on with Ukraine uh, and so forth. Um, it's not in anyone's interest. So uh, hopefully we will not have a full-blown uh, crisis there. What we have in Syria is a continuation frankly, of this so-called shadow war that's been going on between Israel and Iran and the U.S. sometimes, um, you know, for years. Uh, and it, it doesn't get attention unless an American is killed and an American contractor was killed recently. Thanks. It's, uh, you said enough in Richard for four, I read three. Um, that's, you know, that's quite a, I mean, that's quite a development in and of itself, only because if you have enough for one, that doesn't really give you much of a potential for a program. <laughs> you need much more robust production in order to have anything that looks like a, a serious uh, nuclear program that uh, gives them uh, what the experts call second strike capacity. So that's, of course, why the Israelis follow very closely how much is being produced and how much can be weaponized. And so, yeah, I think that, the, you know, the I think all the key players have no interest and letting this, the region sort of fall into a, uh, or escalate into a war, and that's Israel as well. But nevertheless, it's quite a development. Do you want to say anything, Dina, about sort of where, particularly I'm, I'm wondering about sort of, because for the Iranians, given the economic situation, and there's a, there's an app, there's a big debate in Iran, but also here in the Iranian expat community in the United States about sort of what, where sanctions should go and what sanctions do and how effective and all the rest of it. But clearly the Iranian economic situation, which Barbara just described, is not unrelated to the sanctions issue, and the and the Iranians would benefit, uh, and that's where the IAE and a, and a kind of less for less agreement comes in, because what what 
some of the ideas were for sort of limited release of sanctions and so on. Um, and uh, that was floated in the last few you know, weeks or months so that suddenly sort of seemed to not be working out, but the Iranians certainly could would would welcome this, <laughs> some sort of relief on sanctions. So where, what's going on in Iran in terms of, and then that, and that may or may not have any bearing on the China question as, you know, as was said, they were not involved in JCPOA, although the Chinese keep saying, we can play a constructive role now with the International Atomic Energy Committee. Uh, so is, is that in any way, are these things in any way tied in your view? Um, just quickly to, to follow up on what Barbara was saying, I completely agree with everything that she outlined. Um, I would just highlight, though, that, that you know, sitting in the West, we have a tendency to, to focus really on the nuclear issue and with good reason. Um, but I think when you're sitting in the region, um, obviously Israel notwithstanding, um, it's a really different picture. Uh, and I think from, from China's perspective, it's a different picture as well. Um, I think countries in the region, their focus is on what Iran is doing conventionally in the region. They've suffered from that uh, for the last 30, 40 years. Um, and they feel the brunt of that on a daily basis. They don't really feel the brunt of a potentially nuclear uh, Iran um, at the moment. Uh, what they feel is, you know, the threat of Iranian missiles, the threat of Iranian proxies. And I think that's what the region is trying to address with this new kind of two-pronged approach to, to dealing with Iran of containment on the one hand, which they've always tried to do, but they've now supplemented that with a, a measure of engagement of Iran, um, which is a, is a perfectly logical policy for what they're trying to achieve, I, I think. Um, so really their focus is much less the nuclear issue, much more um, what's happening in the region. And, and I think you could probably say the same uh, for a country like China, who's getting involved in, in um, brokering these deals. Um, on sanctions, um, look, you can't, nobody will sit here and argue and say sanctions has had no impact on Iran. Of course, they've had a significant impact on Iran. It's also important to highlight that the Iranian government itself um, it did a wonderful job of, uh, of uh, ruining the Iranian economy and mismanaging it, yeah. um, even without uh, Western unilateral and multilateral yeah. sanctions. So um, sanctions made it worse for sure, um, but they did not, uh, they weren't the cause, put it that way. They weren't the only cause of um, the, the current economic situation in Iran. Um, I uh, am a big believer in, in the this idea of adding on successive rounds of sanctions, I don't think is, is getting us anywhere. Uh, Iran has been sanctioned for the last 40 years. Um, and as far as I can see, and I'd love to be proved wrong, um, it hasn't changed Iranian behavior in any way at all. Um, the only times Iran's behavior changed was when it was in Iran's interest to change its behavior. And it was often when, you know, you had a, you had a carrot or something that was that was thrown in along with a little bit of pressure that 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 changed Iranian behavior. Um, otherwise, it it hasn't been successful. So this idea of increasing sanctions on Iran, this idea that's very prominent amongst the Iranian diaspora and opposition yeah. outside the country, um, very prominent to squeeze Iran, isolate Iran, sanction it further, and that will help the movement. Um, I that really makes my head explode. I don't see how that helps the movement. You've already sanctioned Iran up to here. Um, like I said, it hasn't changed Iranian behavior. All it's done is it's it's made the Iranian people suffer. It's giving it's making it harder for them to access um, medicine and food. Uh, and I'm not quite sure how further cutting off their access to these things um, is going to make the movement uh, any more successful than it has been over the last six months. The other thing to add is that also it's well known that that sanctions end up benefiting those uh, that are the strongest in a country. And so if you're trying to target the Revolutionary Guards in Iran, um, through targeted sanctions, um, it doesn't it doesn't work really well because you end up targeting small and medium sized businesses that go out of business because they can't afford to do business in, a, in an environment where sanctions raise the cost of, uh, of staying um, in business and, and, and functioning. Um, well, who's going to swoop in and fill the void? the organization that's the strongest and the richest and the and the best placed, which is the Revolutionary Guard. So you end up doing this counterproductive thing of actually reinforcing the actor that you're trying to take down. Um, so as you can tell, I'm not a big supporter of sanctions. 
Yeah, I, I happen to agree with everything you just said. And have said uh, Dan, can I, can I just- yes, uh, not, please. I'm, I'm I was sorry, gonna turn you right away anyway. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, I just want to chime in on one, one little thing. Uh, actually, it's not, it's not too little, but uh, you know, uh, regarding the nuclear program, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really very, very um, interesting to talk about it without emphasizing the fact that Iran may want to look very, very strong with a nuclear program because it has a, a change of leadership. In other, in other words, you know, with, with, the, with, with Khamenei departing the scene, a new person coming in, they would want a new person to come in strong and have a whole bunch of files to work with. So, uh, you know, it's a, uh, yes, it's uh, it's good to work on a on a deal with Iran, but you know sometimes it's uh, it's good to ask the question: Does Iran want to work on the deal? Uh, does Iran want to limit what it has, uh, what what it thinks is is a good pressure point uh, for everybody? I just wanted to add that. Yeah, no, I, and I agree with that. And as I was saying before, now they've come so far, particular at this particular moment. I do wonder, by the way, whether I mean, for the sanctions, what san what relief and sanctions would do would make it once again easier for the Iranian government to avoid making any real decisions on the economy at all, <laughs> because the heart of the problem is the way the economy is managed, and so and and fuel sales subsidize inefficiency. So you know that would that, that might be useful for the Ira Ir Iranians, but they but they are getting a, a measure of, of of leverage from sustaining their. Their, their present position. Barbara, you have one finger up there. One finger, and that is that until Iran has the rule of law, it's not going to be able to attract the kind of investment. Right. Uh, yeah. And I would say the same, frankly, about Saudi Arabia, that without reliable enforcement of commercial laws and uh, without uh, assurances that you're not going to be um, sentenced to 35 years in prison for a tweet, or seized as a hostage, it's very difficult to attract uh, the yeah, kind of absolutely. investment that you want, whether it's from your own diaspora or from foreign actors. Uh, um, what's that's, happening that's in Israel the today? That's the root. Sanctions is just, yeah, but that is the root. Yeah, what's happening in Israel today is specifically to that to that point, right? The, right. Uh, uh, they want to, uh, to, to, to subvert the, the judicial process, so, you know, investors are gonna run away. Absolutely. We, we're almost finished here. Anybody want to add any, uh, Danya, anybody else, any final remarks before we... Uh, we yeah. Can, uh, can Robert, I just, I want to ask our, our, our Saudi experts, do you think there's a danger that Saudi Arabia would, would, would uh, sell oil to China for, uh, and, and take UN in return? Because, I mean, that would be an absolute dagger in the heart of the United States. I mean, forget, you know, OPEC plus. I just I, I've been reading between the lines a lot of nervousness about about this de-dollarization and use of UN and other currencies. What do, what do the others think? I'm just curious. If I may, uh, I I really don't think that the Saudis are going to plunge that way. Uh, uh, I, I think that would be uh, a shot across the bow. And uh, hey, we are. We are pulling our ambassador from Washington, basically, kind of thing. Uh, you know, China has been trying to market its yuan for a long, long time, and no buyers. And uh, for the Saudis to come and uh, and do this, uh, no, no, no. I, I, I really doubt that they would go that far. The real is pegged to the pegged to the dollar, so I think yeah. make a move to weaken the dollar kind of weakens the real. I don't know. So I think the. They would think twice before that, but it has been used as, as a threat. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I uh, I know that there has been concerns about it. But I don't foresee that in near term at all. Yeah, I'll just pick up on what, exactly what Daniel just said. It's, uh, you know, it's in Saudi's interest maybe to load it as an idea from time to time to keep people guessing, to, to have it hanging over you as a potential. If you don't play ball, we'll do this. But I, I'd be like him out. I'd be very surprised. But certainly, as a sort of thing to have out there as an option, should we not like something you may do, that's uh, where its value lies. Okay, my cat is reminding me that it's time now to, uh, that we uh, that we close this very interesting uh, conversation down. So I want to 
uh, thank all our guests. Of course, it will be up on the big board at uh, the Arab Center for folks to watch later on as well. So thanks very much for joining us and let's stay tuned to see what, what happens. Thank you.